So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us here in the classroom where the segment of the World Stem Cell Summit that is the patient advocacy set of sessions has been taking place, largely taking place in here. Um, you've heard some patient advocacy commentary out in the atrium, but, uh, but a lot of it has been happening in here, and we're thrilled to have you here for this next presentation uh, by George Eastwood, the Executive Director and Chair of the Board of the Emily Whitehead Foundation. How many of you in the room know who Emily Whitehead is? Excellent. Okay, so most but not all, so good setup for you. And also uh, presenting with George will be Dr. Keith March. And I just want to welcome them and, thanking, and thank them for being here as partners of the World Stem Cell Summit to share their story and also the work of the foundation and once again reinforce what we can do as patients and patient advocates for medical research, scientists, industry, which is what Bernie brings together here at the World Stem Cell Science. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. So, thanks, Melissa. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I think she's already asked the question I was going to start with. How many have heard of Emily? Uh, most is the answer. Uh, and most of the time, you probably hear her father, Tom, give the talk. So taking a little bit of a different spin and talking to Bernie about patient advocacy and you know the impact of narrative in patient advocacy and how it's so important. So we'll start that talk with, ironically, not a story. Because uh, you know too early in the day, and if I were to go through the Emily Whitehead story, there would be a lot of tears. Don't want to go through that now. And Tom does a hell of a lot better job giving that talk. But more importantly, you know, the power of that story and how it brings us all in this room and brings patient advocates together is, is what we'll talk about today and sprinkle in a little bit of other things as well. So you know, it's the power of the narrative of Emily's story that drives a lot of the impact that we see. Uh, without the stories behind the data that we see, uh, there wouldn't be anything else. So advocacy is hugely powered by this. And in order to do so properly, you, you need a story like Emily's to drive that. So you know, what is the role uh, of patient narr narrative and advocacy? And what is an advocate? An advocate is someone who stands up and speaks for you by your side through the whole process. Uh, you know, not just someone that's there in the background. So standing up, having these conversations, talking to doctors, talking to different stakeholders, and how do they do so? They do that through storytelling. I mentioned Emily's story is so powerful as told by Tom, but there's many more of these in the advanced therapy space. So why do we use storytelling? Storytelling is a way to build connection, and that connection to the story is what drives a lot of the impact and a lot of the action in the world we live in. So when we think about storytelling and how it impacts everything, uh, we like to think of it as the life-altering power of proximity. So thinking about this, uh, so much of the world is brought to us by what's close to us. Various kinds of proximity in the world, I'm gonna talk about a couple of them. One of them being physical proximity. So in terms of uh, proximity for Emily and her story, a three hour and 41 minute drive you see here from Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, where the Whitehead family lived. Uh, a couple hours from Hershey Medical Center that didn't offer car tea. But so fortuitous that they were a three hour and 41 minute drive away to be able to drive to the only cancer trial that could save their daughter on a day that they were told to bring her home to hospice. And being so close to the family and being so connected over the last seven years or so, uh, it's been an interesting path where the folks at Hershey were not excited that they were leaving. You know, these community hospitals don't, don't have an understanding of these innovative trials and where they're happening. So really driving this was the physical proximity of the Whitehead family to UPenn and the trial. You know, if it was in North Dakota or the West Coast, we'd like to think maybe they'd pack up and drive and find a way, but that physical proximity was an important part of the story. Uh, you know, next up, uh, emotional proximity. We think about Dr. June, and there's an amazing film of medicine and miracles out there dictating the, the path of CAR-T with Carl and the Whitehead family. Uh, you know, within that film, you see Carl's emotional proximity to the story. Uh, he lost his wife to ovarian cancer in 2001, uh, tried to treat her with an immunotherapy. From there, stepped away from his medical practice, 
and dedicated his life to cancer research and you know, you know, setting up the tone for this physical proximity being three hours from the White House house where his UPenn lab was. But in actuality, his closeness to the tragedy is what the motivation was. So more of an emotional proximity drove that storytelling and that narrative. So uh, Dr. March and I will chat about this a bit later, but there's many other kinds of proximity that are relevant in patient advocacy, clinical trial development, and others. Uh, but how do we increase that proximity? And we do it through storytelling. So visualizing. The closer we are to a tragedy, the easier it is to connect to those involved. Uh, there's stories of plane crashes. When you hear that they're in another country, it's sad news. When you hear that it's in the state you live in, it's a bit closer to home. When you hear you knew five people that were on the plane, all of a sudden, it's really impactful and close. So visualizing that and connecting those stories, incredibly important. So in creating these stories, we don't always have the access to someone like Tom or someone like Carl, whose daughter needs a miracle or whose life drive is to uh, you know, cure all cancers for what they went through personally with their wife. So we have to create these stories uh, outside of the context of the patients and amplify them. And we do that through telling the story in a memorable way and through increased reach over time. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, there's a quote here. You know, we do this through rewiring our brains, for lack of a better word. Uh, some studies done in Princeton by Dr. Yuri Hassan as you hear a story unfold, your brainwaves actually start to synchronize with those of the storyteller. And I think if anybody's seen Tom give the talk and relive it, it's as if we're reliving it each and every time. Uh, I mentioned the film that's released. I think I've gone to seven screenings and cried at a certain moment each and every single time. And it's just through that proximity that it brings to the story in that narrative that makes Emily such a, a notable patient in this space. Uh, so I mentioned the rewiring of the brain. So the brain-altering power of storytelling. Uh, I mentioned brain activity synchronizes while you're listening to a story. And in that synchronization, uh, we create connections, create empathy, create that proximity closer to the stories told by the patients that have gone through it, their caregivers, and so on. Let's get through this. This is a long deck. <laughs> uh, so sorry about that. Uh, so we think about this storytelling and what chain occurs in, in this cycle. <clears throat> so, uh, positioning it as a chain of storytelling is a traditional way in which this used to happen in the past. Starting with a patient, talking to a doctor, and so on, a very linear chain. Uh, something like this. And maybe a, a variety of ways that this could take place. Patient to doctor, a doctor to their colleagues, colleagues to their higher-ups, uh, to donors and investors and politicians to change policy. Uh, you know, a very linear path. The way the world's evolved and the way technology has changed, we've looked at this connected storytelling in a lot of different ways, much like a neural network or the social networks that we inhabit. You know, increasing the reach and connection of these stories are hugely powerful, and we can't do it through one person telling one story. We have to connect them at a higher level and connect them to a mission. So, you know, with that in mind, when we think about how storytelling and narrative affects patient advocacy and the work being done. Uh, looking through a case study, uh, giving to a cause a tale of two separate approaches. So if we look at cause number one, we see the annual reports that our nonprofits have to register. Hugely important, hugely impactful, hugely necessary to bring in donors and the funds and, the, and amplify the mission. But these items are stacked to the gills with statistics. Uh, sometimes hope can look bleak. This much money has been spent and we have not seen advancement. So we hear that out in the community a bunch. There's been a billion dollars spent on X and where are we? Uh, but that basic research does power things, but it's hard to, hard to see that at times. And a lot of it is we could really use your money because it's an impossible problem to solve. If we look at another version of this, we look at the journey to CAR-T. So, you know, this is, this is where the story starts. So, an entry from Carrie's journal in 2010. One day Emily was out playing and totally fine. The next she's in a cancer center getting morphine every two hours. Amazing how fast life can change. So, from that moment, we look at the following 22 months of what Emily went through. Uh, diagnosed May of 2010, 
17 months of chemo. Uh, relapse number one happens in 2011. Five more months of chemo. And so we're looking at 22 total months of chemo with no cure in mind, and a second relapse that occurs in February. And then we look at this side of the story with the CAR-T treatment. 23 days after treatment with the first CAR-T, we see remission. We see a Facebook post from Tom, Tom and Carrie. Uh, no cancer cells, T cells worked from May 10th, 2012, about 11 years ago. So we look at that process, three T cell infusions, cytokine release syndrome, transfer to the ICU, uh, doctors say she may not survive the night, and then Emily begins to stabilize, thanks to fortuitous uh, tocilizumab that Carl happened to work on and present an award to the inventor of. So Emily awakes from a coma on her seventh birthday, cancer-free on May 10th, and now we're looking at 11 years and one year past cure. So we might see a picture of Emily online every year. The last 11 years, this year will be the last one. Officially a year, cure-free. Uh, such an exciting story. Uh, like we said, 22 months of chemotherapy to get her into remission, 23 days after CAR-T in forever remission right now. Um, that led to the creation of the Emily Whitehead Foundation. Emily survival and the need to amplify that message to other patients. So since 2015, funded more than 900,000 in research grants, connected hundreds of families to CAR-T therapy and clinical trials, a lot of that through Tom Whitehead's tireless work to call doctors around the country, connect with patients, uh, and also advocated in a variety of forums on a very personal level that we're looking to amplify through the growth of the foundation in the future. So which one of those two causes should we give our money to? The statistics or the journey with the story afterwards? I guess we'll let you pick. Uh, so the, the gist of all of this is that personal stories create personal connections. Uh, Many times in the Whitehead story, if you look at the film and look at the journey, opportunities to turn the car around and revisit and make decisions, uh, those critical points, there were probably seven to eight, I think, that Dr. June and Tom talk about where one of them, made incorrectly, wouldn't have led to this cure. Uh, if they were in Boise or Bismarck, would this have happened? As I said earlier, that proximity, once again, close enough to the story. Uh, and, and with all of that proximity in mind, we look at proximity equaling closeness, that closeness becoming personal, and how that personal nature creates a powerful story in the end. And that is the end. Uh, I'm gonna take it out of here. A little bit of mishap on the wrong part of the slides, but uh, you know, we talk about proximity. Keith and I were chatting, you know, the, the True Trials initiative that he's working on. I showed him some of the slides from the presentation. And there were probably seven or eight other kinds of proximity that came up. Uh, one of them was a digital proximity that, top, that Keith aims to fix and part of the True Trials Initiative. So bring him on up here to chat about how that connection to clinical trials is, that the Whitehead Foundation is passionate about and how the Whitehead Foundation connecting to folks like Keith, Dr. Mark, and other members of the advisory board will take that to the next level. So there you go. It's a real pleasure to follow uh, right behind what you had to say, George, and it's a great, uh, a great connection. Uh, you, you've inspired me by the talking about the story to tell a story here at the beginning, um, because maybe it'll be memorable. And, and the story was also inspired by your last slide about the car driving around. So the way that the True Trials Initiative began uh, was in looking at the literature and seeing that more and more literature was being published about the topic that there were bad actors and clinics that were doing things that weren't FDA approved. And, and you know, I saw an article about that, uh, as I remember, it had a couple hundred clinics, maybe even 500 eventually. And then there was another article a little bit later, and it's like 2,000 clinic. And I was just thinking, this is all pretty negative, and it doesn't really help the field, and it certainly doesn't help patients if they're driving the proverbial car of their body and they're running out of gas because they have a disease or if they're driving an actual car trying to get from Boise or Bismarck to a place where a trial is, it does not help them to say, don't go there because they have bad gas and they might have sugar water in the gas and it will poison your engine. It's just not helpful. 
You need to know where to go to get the real gas that will actually maybe help you get to where you're going. So as I thought about that, I wondered why we didn't have actually some methodology that would share with patients where they could find FDA authorized trials. In other words, the ones that were being conducted in the proper way according to FDA or other uh, local authority body regulatory guidelines, IRBs, and so forth, and it felt like that was a really good, a good thing to bring forward if possible. And as I dug into that a little bit more with some other friends and colleagues, what we learned was that didn't exist because the FDA historically has not been able to share on their own when and where an IND or an IDE, which is a parallel thing in the device world, exists. Because I, I presume, I don't know this has not been told to me, but I guess talking to people, maybe it's a legacy of the pharmaceutical company circumstance in which it would be preferable not to let every competitor know when you got your IDE or something like this. I, I don't know. I do see uh, a good friend and colleague in the audience from FDA uh, who's shaking their head yes, so I guess I'll say maybe that's not unreasonable. Um, so it's a legacy thing. They can't share it. But the idea was what if it could be shared? What if we could actually approach clinicians, scientists, investigators, sponsors of various types, and verify that in fact they had FDA authorization via an IND or an IDE or some, some pathways of that nature. Those are the main ones, of course, that would be relevant. So I started to talk to a couple of people about this and had a great privilege to uh, have uh, Peter Marks, uh, Dr. Marks, visiting our campus at the University of Florida a little bit before the pandemic to talk to our undergraduate students in our undergraduate regenerative medicine program. And one of our students from the fourth year of that program is actually here in the audience uh, because she's working here at Wake Forest for an internship this summer, so that's pretty cool too. Well, anyway, Dr. Mark said, that's a pretty reasonable idea. It's a good idea. You know, we should tell them where they can go if we can find a way to do that. And my vision was if we could have a map that was an easily navigable map of where to go for trials, and a searchable uh, tab tabular format that would connect with the map back and forth, that might be actually a helpful thing. And thus, with the help of a lot of people and an incredible support from Dr. Marks, was born the True Trials Initiative that's uh, showing you today. We just made the map public uh, a few days ago, kind of a soft launch. We'll be having a, more of a splash, we hope, uh, in just a few months um, in an organized way that we're working on. So this is what we think is going to be the first and only platform that will provide patients a little louder. I don't mind as long as I'm not yelling at you too much. The first and only platform, I feel like now I'm a radio announcer, that will provide patients with ready access to only <laughs> FDA authorized regenerative medicine and cell-based trials. Why is this so important? I do feel silly doing this a little bit. Edit that out of the video if you want. Um, there is currently no tool that actually makes this available to patients. Where to go? How do they drive their bodily car or their uh, automotive car to the right place? But there are lots of advertisements and websites that show or feature non FDA approved trials, including a preponderance, in my estimation, of the ones that talk about cell therapies on clinicaltrials.gov, which is really kind of odd but it's been an issue of discussion in the press lately. I think all of you probably know what an IND is. If you don't, raise your hand and I will go through this slide. No pressure. Looks like I can skip this slide. Okay. So it's important to connect patients to FDA authorized regenerative medicine and cell-based clinical trials, whether they be in the world of MSCs or CAR-T, you know, all versions of trials. Where can they find the trials? And as George pointed out, it was important for the family to become aware where that trial was and, and drive to it directly. This ensures access to the credible therapies as opposed to at least uncertain therapies. And because cells are pretty smart, they know what to do. If you prepare it biologically properly, not under FDA auspices, you're still going to get a biologically active cell. But the problem is if it's not done with some of those, let's say, safeguards and oversights in place, you don't know if that's going to happen to the greater to that high of a degree of probability. There may be errors in the way it's made, and a variety of things could occur, some of which could be negative. And we sometimes hear about that. We also hear positive anecdotes, of course. The other element is 
accelerating enrollment into trials. I've heard from 40 to 50 percent of trials fail to fully enroll and therefore fail to complete their objective because they don't get enough enrollment and connectivity there. And only one to two percent of typical physicians actually send their patients to clinical trials at all. So we have some issues to solve in terms of making that connection happen. Thus the idea of the map whereby we would want to see only the FDA authorized trials in the United States. We could search for trials with specific conditions, find out who to contact in terms of coordinators at those locations, um, enroll the trials with, you know, again, the assurance of the FDA and IRB types of coverages and regulations, and thus support data collection that would ultimately result in availability to people, even with third-party payer coverage. So, you know, on the website, if you go there, you will find, and I'll give you the links at the end, uh, you can go and find a whole bunch of great videos. Uh, very grateful uh, that uh, Dr. Marks was able to talk in detail about why this could be helpful. This is just one. We cut it up a lot of different ways into different questions at the answer. See, can you hear this? Can you turn this up in the AV area? Why is it important, she says, for there to be a safe space? I think I'm going to have to send you to the website. You can see he's talking about it. There's uh, a letter that I was very grateful to receive uh, indicating his support for this initiative fairly early on. The point is, even though the AV is not properly linked, if you go to the website, you will hear what he has to say. I'm so sorry it's not audible at this moment. And there are about 10, 10 videos like that, at least as resources. So who would this initiative benefit? It will, it will benefit patients, sponsors and investigators, regulators, third party payers. And I would also add even to this, as I think about it, the, the clinicians or physicians that don't themselves run trials, but also have that capability to send patients when they need them. Meaning, if they know where to send the patients, again, they can point that car in the right direction. So patients gaining access to educational tools and a growing list of FDA authorized trials to enhance their trust uh, as against the noise of misinformation, if you will. More particularly of import, I think, in the cell and regenerative medicine world, because in the area of small drugs or other kinds of more standard pharmaceutics, you don't really have that many pharmacies that are not really pharmacies popping up and saying, hi, we're a pharmacy, but we're not really. But that is happening, as we just alluded to earlier with the stem cell world, and so with cells. This is, uh, this is where we want to bring up the signal on the background of noise. For the sponsors and investigators, there's a, literally a stamp of approval. It's the one that we have in the lower there. Um, uh, and uh, at our last advisory board meeting with Dr. Marks, we were talking about the idea of those trials that have IMD or IDE you know, can have the stamp of the true trialist seal of approval. And uh, we can let that be known that that represents that they do have, in fact, uh, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, regulatory authorizations that bolster credibility to, uh, to expand the you know, recruitment, enrollment, and promote retention. Regulators, well, clearly this, uh, the presence or absence of this can be helpful in, in a sense for the FDA and others to, again, show what is regula regulatorily uh, authorized and which are not. And then finally, the third party payers. Uh, it is not going to be typical, maybe ever, that a third party payer will be fired up about paying, starting with Medicare on, on over and CMS, if it's not actually gone through a reasonable clinical trial, an FDA authorized clinical trial. So this is super important for that topic as for that group as well. And also to enhance early payer awareness of actively enrolling trials would seem to be a benefit as well as they prepare to hopefully be able to pay for things that are useful. So we hope that some of the people, uh, some of the organizations, the entities, the researchers, that find themselves in this room and that ultimately will hear this video uh, through uh, Bernie's systems uh, and colleagues out uh, in YouTube space will join. 
sooner than later. Why would you join sooner? Well, it supports the public policy cause to uh, increase patient confidence, a very positive message. Here's where you can go instead of saying there's where not to go. Uh, an appropriate way to build relationships with patient groups, regulators, decision makers, all the elements that I just spoke about earlier. And of course, early adopters can help us have by having input into how to further shape and, and grow this program of true trials. Uh, instead of waiting to join later when they're ready, everyone is doing it. So we hope we will have um, people coming in sooner than later. This is our advisory board. It's an amazing advisory board. Each one of these are friends, good friends and colleagues, and I really appreciate so much. Uh, I think you'll recognize many of them, if not all. Um, at the bottom of this, this is a snapshot off the website. You can see our, our earliest partners. I've been very grateful to Dave Pierce at Sanford Health, uh, to, to Julie and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, uh, to Tom, and now George with Emily Whitehead to cook. Uh, and we just hope that some of you will get on board, help us to get the message out, and importantly, help us to support this initiative with foundational funding so that it becomes something that will be sustained and growing over time. I've been very grateful in the last few months that uh, Nancy Myers uh, with Catalyst Healthcare uh, Consulting and her team shown here has come aboard. Nancy as the executive director now for this uh, organization um, and, a, and a wonderful connection uh, also actually through Dr. Marks. Um, here we have uh, a few snapshots on the website. You see uh, the look at the front of it. You see submit trials and the button on the upper right. If you click that, you're requesting inclusion on that True Trials map, and it says basically, does your trial use a cellular product? And it gives a variety of uh, cell source products, including acellular components like exosomes, secretome, ERP. And has your team received confirmation to proceed? Because that's all we get and need. We don't need anything proprietary. We just need that your study may proceed, email or letter, a single page typically. FDA, so we know that that's an actual thing. If it looks counterfeit, we'll send it to FDA and check it out. We did talk about that process as well, but we know what those should look like. To request inclusion, then, if you say yes, we satisfy that, then we you know, go through things like the trial coordinator name, email study name, sponsor name, whether it's investigator or industrially sponsored, uh, IMD number, what are you treating, what's your agent, what's your phase, and the key inclusion and exclusion criteria ideally expressed in a way that the patients can readily understand. Um, and if I, all, you get through all that, you go to attach file, you attach your uh, this trial may proceed letter, it's what we need, the information, and it will be promptly put up in your map. Now this is a workflow that talks through that. I don't think we need to go through that, but I kind of showed you the pieces of it. You know, how do you get to actually put it up? Very simple, just those stages I described. You know, and this is important for patients. Here's a patient example of various uh, uh, people that have tried it in the beta phase. You know, and, you know, Bill is saying, I spent enough time searching for information on cell-based therapies to know where I could find heart help for arthritis in certain joints after a lifetime of sports-related re activities. True Trials provides the key to finding FDA-authorized trials, and now we can know the menu of options in this country worth pursuing. Um, this is Dr. Akey, she's speaking here and is at the conference. She's speaking uh, later on this afternoon about pipeline. Uh, she works in Gainesville, she's got a primary care practice. She's a UF Gator uh, practicing out in the community. And talks about her interest in regenerative medicine and how patients often ask about these and how to distinguish treatments of uncertain regulatory approval from those which are authorized and well-founded. The True Trials resource provides the ability to recommend sites to patients with confidence for the first time. This is what the map looks like. Rather than actually navigate it in real time here, which we could do if anyone wants to and if there's time, but I think it was easier just to take some shots. So this is basically what it looks like. As you'll see, importantly at the top, there is color coding general trials, which are adult predominantly or really now exclusively are orange. Pediatric trials, that was a, a outgrowth of our partnership with the Emily Whitehead Foundation in which those on the Emily Whitehead trial finder and then ultimately growing it to be those which are pediatrically oriented predominantly cancer will be in blue. So that's the, those are the ones that are of particular uh, importance uh, if you have a pediatric and a cancerous type of situation. You can see uh, 
the, the number now is still in a less than 100. We need to grow to probably about 350 or 400. If we include the car keys, we'll be more closer to 1,000 eventually. And that's where we are right now with growing and getting um, the trials to be loaded in with those authorization letters. You can search it. You can go to the map. Uh, and here at this point, um, I just want to um, ask George to talk a little bit about, you know, the Emily Whitehead perspective on these and uh, come on up and talk about it a little bit and then I'll close out for us. Yeah, I think the partnership was born out of a lot of the work, uh, believe it or not, that Carrie Whitehead did manually. Uh, the clinical trial finder site that is on the Emily Whitehead Foundation.org, uh, manually updated every two weeks, vetted by Carrie and, and searched through. Uh, kind of an unscalable way to grow as the CAR-T trials have grown through collaboration with Keith in connection to a, a more technologically advanced platform, uh, giving a, a better visual representation of some of the trials that Tom and Carrie and, and others within the foundation direct patients to. So, uh, you know, connecting both the regenerative medicine and, and cell therapy side of things is an ongoing discussion between uh, True Trials and Emily Whitehead Foundation. How do we continue to enhance the data available here? How do we continue to grow the impact it can have? And how do we how do we show patients how close they can be bringing up that proximity once again? So both their physical proximity, but digitally they can always be connected to the True Trials map. And you know, we're working on the best ways to convey that information and, and get it up to patients together. So we have right here. Uh, we have right here the uh, examples of trials, you know, the leukemia realm, ALL, and B-cell ALL. You can see St. Jude, you can see two at Philadelphia. You know, those are the exactly the kinds of things that uh, will be of importance to these parents. If you hover over one of those, it gives you a little bit of an explanation of what it is, and then a submit inquiry that takes you to the coordinator at that site, whoever's handling those inquiries for the site specifically. Um, you can also search, in this case, you have a knee up there. Someone, if you type in knee, that shows you the 14 places in the country that currently are shown uh, as those that are authorized for this. And I'm sure there's more than that. Like I said, we're building on it right now, but you can see the functionality. And it is completely functional, driving you around. So when you go to the website, you'll find it working. Each one of these are question clips from Peter, Dr. Marks. Why would it be important to have a safe space? Why, do phys why is it important for physicians to participate? Why might they not refer patients to trials? What's up with that? Um, trials will not show up unless, unless authorized by FDA, and how does this help the field of regenerative medicine? Um, this is just, a, as they call it, a GIF or GIF, driving around. You can see a little bit of the activity that I just described, submitting an inquiry and taking to a certain place. Here are some examples of what's in and what's out. Uh, basically, if you're a cell therapy or cell-based therapy, and here are a whole host of them on the left side, just examples you can kind of scan through. Those are kinds of therapies. We're not covering everything in the drug world or the device world. That would be tens or hundreds of thousands. We're covering regenerative medicine and cell-based therapies, uh, essentially advanced uh, biologics. Um, and what's not in, uh, there are some examples there. This is an eligibility approach. You know, that's also findable on the website. We've kind of talked through it, uh, but it's there. If, if, if you click no, I'm not eligible, this pops up and you can see how you might become eligible. This is the way to access the website. Uh, that's the link as well. If anyone uh, aims at that particular item, you will get it. Uh, but you can also type in truetrials.org. Uh, and um, the QR code works. Yeah. It should work. And of course, how could you help? Send your trials. We need to build a number of trials. If you have authorization letters, that's all we need. And uh, we'll connect them up so that your trials will enroll more quickly, whether you're a business, a, a corporate entity, uh, an academic medical center, or a non-academic medical center, or in fact, just a sponsor investigator level. Um, and of course, we need foundational funding, especially as we launch uh, this year. Um, you know, whether you're a founder, a true trialist, or a supporter, or something else, we hope that you will be able to help with this initiative. Um, you can contact me, of course, many of you have my contacts, and you can also call or email our executive director, Nancy Myers. This is her contact information. And um, I'm just really grateful to have had the ch chance to share this. Thank you, Bernie, for the introduction uh, to share this at this meeting. And thanks to George, who's uh, one of our advisory board and with whom we now have a great relationship with
him and Tom and the Emily Whitehead Foundation. We, we have time for a couple of questions for the, these two presenters, and then I also want to let everybody in the room know that right after this, we're going to have a presentation on Dr. Jean Loring's uh, pioneering work with IPS cells to treat Parkinson's disease, and Jennifer Robb from Summit for Stem Cell who raised the funding for Jean's research for a number of years before it was spun to Aspen Neuroscience. They're here in the back. I want to keep this good crowd, and I want to make sure if we have questions for from this presentation uh, that you have time to ask them right now. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, I would, um, I, this is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for spearheading this. I, I, my colleagues and I at FDA were always frustrated Steve, by Give him that so we yeah. can hear this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, thank you. I was just saying kudos to you and this whole effort. It's absolutely wonderful. My colleagues and I at FDA were often frustrated by the fact that we couldn't talk publicly about who had an IND, what was in an IND, still can't do that, of course, but, um, and, you know, we, we interacted with some of the self-therapy uh, societies, and they, they would put up statements, I don't know if you talked to any of them to sort of coordinate with them as well, you know, they're talking about um, unapproved stem cell therapies and so on, so just a suggestion if you haven't gone there, but I was curious about, um, I think the proximity argument, there's not as much fraudulent activity in the gene therapy arena, and gene therapy is going to fall under a general But the proximity argument of people find The people looking for um, gene therapy trials also want to be something useful to include in the next version of this. Uh, that's a great suggestion, Steve, and I do agree with that. I think that's a very good idea, and it is something we've talked to Dr. Marks about. <clears throat> And we just started with something that was a little bit smaller, literally and numerically, but I think going there is a very wise idea and it's appropriate. It certainly fits under advanced biologics. There's no way it doesn't. And of course, CAR-T is a cell carrier of a new gene, or set of genes, or, or in similar cells to that. So I think that makes sense. Uh, we have talked to some of the organizations. The organizations, by and large, I think have been challenged. In my opinion, this is not a general thing, but my personal opinion by saying, what not to do, uh, and then providing very long and difficult to read for the average patient information about what to do, and I just uh, honestly find it quite unhelpful. Yeah. I thought we needed to provide a simple, positive direction. Go here. Here, here. But if, if they'll advocate for that, that would be great. Yeah, yeah and, and those are part of the early conversations with Tom and the Emily Whitehead Foundation, what should be included, what shouldn't. Yeah. The FDA approval piece, you're not going to find a stem cell clinic offering a CAR-T most likely, but that proximity argument, and also the, the grouping and, and really the definition of these terms, what's a cell therapy, what's a gene therapy. Patients, the FDA, doctors, therapeutic developers all have different views. So I think that advanced therapy moniker and trying to identify that is an important piece of this in the future. Everybody looks at it a different way. I think the first advisory board meeting, I brought that up with Dr. Marks, where a CAR-T is looked at as a gene therapy, it's a gene-modified therapy to the FDA. But to every patient, that autologous cell journey is a cell therapy. How do we you know, connect those, uh, those definitions and, and define that through part of true trials and what we do at the Emily Whitehead Foundation? Just amazing. We do have one more question from Dr. Parker. And before we go to him, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this from a patient advocate perspective of being frustrated with clinicaltrials.gov for so many years and the fact that it was so easy for people to just, still is, for them to just list themselves there when they have nothing to do with an FDA path clinical trial. I'll say it, since the rest of you don't feel like you can, I'll say it. It's been horrible. And I'm so glad that True Trials exists and I'm going to be your advocate. All right. Well, Melissa, I really appreciate that. And I also want to say, you know, this has been the work for a long time, of kind of a, a passion work of many people, uh, not only an advisory board, but I particularly want to thank uh, you know, the people that helped us to make this happen at the dream stage. Uh, 
some people that aren't even on the website, uh, um, you know, Chris, Amy, Saida, you know, there are others, uh, you know, when you hear this, you'll know who I'm talking about, but I really appreciate it. We couldn't have done any of this without uh, those people. So this is such a powerful resource. It's very exciting what you've, what you've done here. What, what I'm wondering is, don't you think the patients are going to be asking for some sort of comparative information on the website as well? I think what you're going to do is just present a database of opportunities. But don't you think people and maybe institutions are going to be saying, well, we, we want you to show how many trials we've already completed, you know, to bolster the interest yeah, in the we, In terms of how many, we hadn't really thought about that, but in terms of comparison, you could certainly envision that. And we did talk early on, and we still could, develop uh, a way of helping navigate. You know, we wondered if that would be a cost plus. This is, uh, from the patient perspective, intended to be a free resource, but, you know, could we offer consultation? Because some of that becomes complicated. You, you saw there's 14 knee trials. Well, how do I know which one to go to? Should I use adipose? Should I use bone marrow? Should I use, uh, what if it's randomized? Well, how is that going to be taken care of? Is it a crossover? I mean, there are a lot of things that you or I or those in this room could explain to people, and we might consider how to do that, but we just didn't engage that at the first stage. It is an option, I think. But I, th I think that would require human interaction, at least ideally. Thank you. Okay. A round of applause for